Yeah, so welcome everyone to the sixth and final episode of season three of the Ice Orgeny Club. Um, today we're lucky enough to have uh, Charlotte Weitkempel from, uh, well, she just graduated her PhD from the University of Birmingham and she'll uh, she'll give us her talk today. So yeah, all yours, Charlotte. Okay, sorry, that was a bad start, already muted. Um, thank you for the introduction. And of course, it's an honor to be speaking at the Isogeny Club. Um, in advance, I'm really sorry, my voice is still a bit um, off from being um, from having the flu, so I hope um, it's all understandable. Um, and today I'll be presenting um, some joint work that I did with Benjamin, Peter, Simon, Christoph, and Miha. And it is about <clears throat> computing isogenies of fixed degree between two singular elliptic curves. And firstly, I want to go through, of course, uh, um, kind of an overview of what I'll talk about today. And I'll begin with some background um, and some motivation of why we're even looking at this fixed degree isogeny problem. And then I'll introduce the general strategy that we're working with to compute these isogenies. And I will then go a little bit more into the detail of what each of these steps contain. Um, eventually, um, our paper only really focuses on one of the steps. Um, and I will um, go into some detail of um, how we use different already existing algorithms to, um, to solve the norm equation. And finally, we'll also look at some hybrid versions of um, these previous algorithms, um, which give us some more freedom and parameter choices. Um, yeah, and then I'll finish with a summary and um, maybe some open questions as well that um, we haven't managed to answer yet in our paper. So let's begin with um, a general introduction. So I, I'm pretty sure everyone who starts learning about super singular elliptic curves and isogenies at some point uh, comes to the comes to a question of how do we know when there are actually isogenies between different curves of specific degrees, and also how do we compute these um, these isogenies if they exist. Um, and if we begin with the most basic of these kind of isogeny problems, um, and I mean basic more in the sense of fundamental rather than easy, um, then we naturally arrive at the pure isogeny problem, which is the problem of finding any isogeny between um, two super singular elliptic curves. And this has been shown um, to be equivalent to computing endomorphism rings, um, and this is generally not very straightforward. And when we look now at what kinds of isogenies we see in practice um, in isogeny-based cryptography, we can, for example, find um, often that there are additional constraints on, um, on, finding, on what kind of isogeny is considered the right isogeny to solve this problem. Um, and for example, the most well-known or one of the most well-known would be the SIDH variant of the pure isogeny problem, which requires the isogeny that is found not to just be any isogeny, but to have a specific degree and also to um, exhibit a specific torsion action um, on a given basis. And um, of course, this has been um, been uh, attacked uh, in the SIDH attacks last year. So I guess we were interested in looking at a bit of a more general problem. Um, and this is the fixed degree isogeny problem, um, which means we have to, given super singular elliptic curves, and um, we also are given a degree, and we want to find an isogeny um, between those two elliptic curves. And to just make this formal, um, we're working over a field of 
prime characteristic P um, and we consider D to be the, um, the given positive uh, integer, which is the degree of the isogeny we're looking for. And um, we don't really want to put any restrictions on this um, degree D other than that we consider um, Ds that are larger than um, P to the one half um, because um, there is an equivalence to um, endomorphism ring computations for smaller degrees. Um, this has been done, for example, by the GPST authors, Galbraith, um, Petit, Shani, and T, um, where when you compute um, the connecting ideal of the endomorphism rings, um, then the smallest element will correspond to an isogeny of roughly degree square root of P. Um, and this can be efficiently computed, computed in this situation. So we're looking for um, degree Ds where um, that are larger or at least um, square root of p, uh, square root of p, sorry. And uh, we also, oops, sorry, we also um, mainly look at um, isogenies which have degree smaller than p to the three, so p cubed, um, because there are some ways to compute um, isogenies quite fast or at least faster than what we can do uh, using the KLPT algorithm. Um, yes, and to kind of uh, quantify the uh, the size of or how much larger d is than p square root of p, we um, use this um, this variable epsilon over here, which is always positive. Um, and there are some schemes um, which at the moment use use more general isogenies, so isogenies which aren't necessarily of very smooth um, degrees. Um, for example, we have P-side or Q-Festa um, or some of the C-sign adaptations where, um, for example, prime degrees are used, but uh, the algorithms we, um, we come up with do not actually have any impact on the particular security claims of these schemes. Um, our hope is more that eventually um, our algorithms might uh, be helpful when selecting parameters um, for potentially new schemes or when uh, there is the hope of um, kind of increasing the, the de degree of an isogeny um, in order to decrease the prime size, for example. Um, and then maybe um, the algorithms we present will, um, will be applicable. So oops. currently, um, I just want to go over kind of the, what the state of the art in this kind of computation, uh, of this kind of computation is at the moment. So um, these are just, um, the kind of uh, complexities we consider when we're computing endomorphism rings, um, where we're using classically um, an algorithm by Eisentrieger et al. And this can be sped up with Grover. Um, and then, of course, we also need to look at um, how costly computing fixed degree isogenies is at the moment. Um, without considering the algorithms that we have later in this talk. Um, and currently, there are a few different um, approaches for solving this fixed degree isogeny problem. For example, uh, classically, we have, I mean, standard uh, exhaustive search where um, we search over all outgoing D isogenies from the starting curve. Um, so, for example, we could search over all the kernels um, that are possible. And this um, is, of course, big O of D um, cost. And this is also the, the only, real, um, only real option we have if D is a prime number, um, because all the other algorithms require um, us to kind of be able to factor 
key in some sense. Um, right, so the other kind of options we would have are a meet in the middle approach um, where we can where we can decrease the complexity a little bit. Um, and then of course there are some kind of an Orschwalk-Lina related um, collision search algorithms, which um, really quite highly depend on the memory that is available. Um, and one of the, I guess, uh, benefits of using the algorithms that we uh, look at is that they barely require any memory to be available. Um, so yeah, this is one of the selling points of our approach. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically um, this is it for computing fixed degrees, um, fixed degree isogenies classically. Um, and then there are quantum speedups. So um, of course we have uh, exhaustive search again, where uh, we utilize Grover's algorithm, which usually gives us a square root, a square root speed up. Um, and this is the case in this situation. And then there's also a claw finding algorithm by Tani. Um, but I put this in brackets because there's some controversy or some uh, differing opinions about whether this is actually a practical algorithm um, because there are some, um, or because there's quite high cost to accessing um, memory that is required. Um, yeah, so let's move on to, oh, I've just added here a little bit where, um, in which cases these um, algorithms apply. And we can see that exhaustive search um, is the only one that, for example, works for, um, yeah, completely general uh, degrees. Whereas a uh, meet in the middle and from Oscar we now obviously require some sort of smoothness in the parameters. Right. Um, yeah, so let's move on to um, the way we approach this problem. So um, recall again, we have um, two elliptic curves, which are super singular. Those are E1 and E2 um, defined over FP squared. And we're given a positive integer D and we want to find um, a degree D isogeny between E1 and E2. And um, the way we start is by um, computing endomorphism rings of these, um, of these curves. And this of course is not a super, um, is not a very efficient um, way to start, but we're hoping that um, the complexity of um, the further steps that we are um, going through in our strategy will not really um, become more costly than um, the endomorphism ring computations. And this is kind of how, um, how we came up with this idea. Um, right, so we start with computing the endomorphism rings. Then we construct um, a connecting ideal between those two quaternion orders. Um, we look at the, or we compute the norm form associated to the home set. And then we try to find um, an integer represent or um, an element representing D um, in this ideal um, by solving this norm equation. Then we compute an ideal um, equivalent to the connecting ideal and uh, of the correct norm that we want and convert the ideal back to an isogeny. And in a little bit more detail, this kind of involves, as I said, first computing the endomorphism ring where we can use Eisenträger et al and the Grover speed up depending on whether we have quantum resources. Um, and we can then uh, use Kirschma and Voigt's algorithm to find a connecting ideal between um, those maximal quaternion orders. And when we have this connecting ideal um, between the endomorphism rings, we know that 
um, an isogeny between the two corresponding curves. Um, this corresponds to an element in the ideal. And if the isogeny, for example, is of degree d, then we know that the norm of the corresponding ideal element um, must be d times the ideal norm. Um, so this basically means that we want to find an element of this particular norm. Um, and this can be done via the norm form associated to the ideal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, this is um, where we go into a bit more detail. So um, the way we do is we do, uh, we compute an LLL reduced um, graph matrix of the ideal with, where the, um, where the entries of the matrix correspond to an inner product between the basis elements of the idea. And all of these elements or all of these entries of G are um, divisible by the ideal norm. So we can normalize um, with this ideal norm and eventually end up with, um, with a corresponding norm form. This is what we call Q here. So um, Q is a four variable form, a quadratic form, uh, which we can compute from, from G. And as I said before, our aim is to um, represent our integer D via this norm form. So basically what we want to do is find as any solution um, where Q of X1 up to X4 is equal to D. And yeah, we can also um, compute some, some bounds on the, um, on the values of XI, which um, makes it a little bit easier for us later on to actually work on the step. And finally, we want to basically translate the solution of this norm form back um, back into an isogeny. And we can do this via using, for example, KLPT, um, and then finding an isogeny representation. And this, of course, depends on whether um, what kind of degree we have, because smooth degrees can obviously be represented by um, nice sequence of rational maps whereas this is a bit more tricky for non-smooth degrees. Um, but because all but the fourth step um, of our strategy are um, kind of already efficiently or at least quasi-efficiently solved, um, we focus our efforts onto this, this fourth step here, which is representing D by the bone form. And in particular, this means solving this, um, this norm equation where we have some, um, we have some further, I guess, uh, ideas of the size of, for example, the, the basis um, elements of the ideal, which come from uh, the determinant of the home set, um, where, yeah, we can say that the norm of all the sigma i is roughly square root of p, and where the LLL reduced basis um, and the, the norms of the elements also implies that we have some bounds on the solutions xi. Um, and here this um, c is a small, um, small scalar, um, which comes from this choices made um, during the LLL reduction. Um, and I think this is quite small. So we're looking at something like an eight, for example. Um, right. Um, to, yeah, basically um, work on this, um, on solving this norm equation. Uh, the first idea we had was looking at yeah what kind of um, 
ways are there to solve uh, Diophantine equations. And of course, one of the first things that came to our minds was um, looking at Kornakia's algorithm. And Kornakia's algorithm solves equations that are, <clears throat> that are uh, bivariate. So our idea was to basically um, reduce our situation down to a bivariate case. Um, and this is where we were hoping that um, when we guess two of the variables, um, we can gain something by doing this guessing using Grover's speed up in the quantum setting. So basically how we start is we have um, these bounds on the solutions xi, <laughs> and we um, make two guesses for um, say x3 and x4. And this means um, we can substitute these, um, these guesses into our uh, norm equation. And we end up um, with a, with a um, quadratic equation um, that I've written out here, um, which um, yeah, we can simplify a little bit because um, of course the gram matrix um, is symmetric. And um, this doesn't look um, specifically immediately like an equation that um, is solvable by Kornakia, <clears throat> but there exists some um, variable transformations um, where we can um, transform this equation into um, into an equation that looks more like something that Kornakia can solve. Um, and this is this x squared minus dy squared equals to n here. Um, and the only real requirement that Kornakia has on um, has on this um, on the parameter sizes here is that we need to find some square roots modulo n which means that in the end, eventually at some point um, while running the algorithm, we have to factor in. Um, and this is only really um, feasible um, if we um, have uh, some sort of bound on the, on the number of distinct prime factors. And we can basically, um, show that um, if we make some sort of bound, for example, um, 11 times log log n, um, where that is the maximum allowed um, number of prime factors for n, we can, abstain, we can obtain a solution in quite a large um, number of cases or a proportion of cases after we've worked through all the possible guesses. Um, so we kind of, um, decided that abandoning n, um, if it has more prime divisors than this bound, um, I mean, gives us a small failure probability, but it's um, acceptably small. So um, yes, we, we work with, <coughs> um, with the idea that um, in a very large amount of cases, we actually do obtain a solution. And um, Kornakia's algorithm also works in the sense that um, it will provide us with the, um, with an answer, uh, with basically the decision also of whether the solution exists, because if there is an, a solution for our particular guess, it will be found um, unless we get into this um, too large um, N problem. And um, basically, um, this gives us um, the following complexity. Um, if we uh, yeah, want to find um, a d, d degree isogeny where d is equal to, or roughly equal to p to the half plus epsilon, um, where um, we have classically, um, from the guessing, we um, have a factor of O star um, P to the epsilon. 
and then a um, also factor for factoring n, of course. Um, and in the quantum time, we um, of course can disregard a factoring of n and obtain a, um, a complexity of O star of p to the e p to the e over two. So a classic a, a standard uh, square root speed up. And um, yes, otherwise um, the algorithm returns no solution if, if there is none or if we have unfortunately um, run into this very unlikely situation of having too many um, prime divisors of n for the specific guesses that would have given us the correct solution. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, I thought I wouldn't have as much time as I do now, so I um, went a little, um, I didn't go into so much detail with the Coppersmith algorithms, um, but Coppersmith um, came up with many uh, different ways to solve um, multivariate equations, basically, some modular, some not. Um, and again, we want to, of course, find, an uh, find a solution to our equation q equals d. Um, and we do this by using different types of variants that have come from um, Coppersmith's initial um, propositions. And for example, we're looking at um, a method by Coron, which um, also deals with uh, bivariate equations. So this is a indirect comparison really to the Kornakia approach. Um, and here um, we again guess two variables um, and then solve the remaining equation with, uh, with Caron's um, algorithm. And we also look at a version um, of the Coversmith algorithm by Bauer and Zhu, where they look at um, trivariate um, equations. So we only have to guess one variable. Um, and we were interested in seeing how um, how guessing more or working more with these equation solving algorithms, um, how this interacts and how we can um, get the best possible um, complexities for specific degrees of isotropies D. Um, and because there are some limitations um, to the Coppersmith algorithm um, or in general, and, the Koran and Bauerjou, of course, um, also have these limitations. We, they do not provide solutions for um, all parameters epsilon. So we have some, um, yeah, we have some restrictions in when these um, these algorithms will actually um, provide us with a good solution. And in particular, we have. <coughs> that the bivariate Quran complexity is um, O star of P to the epsilon classically. And we can also speed this up with co-research um, when we have quite small um, isogeny degrees. So we're looking at isogenies of degree between square root of P and P here. Um, and the range for the trivariate Bajou to be um, efficient is uh, even smaller and I think it is 0 0.16 um, is the upper bound for epsilon so we're looking at um, yeah quite a small um, range of uh, variables from uh, square root of p to p to the half plus um, 0 0.16 so uh, p to the 0 0.66 and mainly what is interesting I think about um, the using the trivariate approach in the end is that um, it becomes it is quite efficient but only for this very small um, small set of parameters so um, we also looked at the idea of um, 
incorporating more guessing because of course um, if we have um, access to some sort of quantum setting we we can guess uh, more efficiently with Grover's search and um, the idea was then to basically still start with um, with computing the anamorphism rings of the curves but to first then also uh, then also guess a part of the isogenies and of course this is only really um, possible when the isogeny degree is smooth enough and um, so for example if we're looking at um, d that is equal to l to the e um, where we then guess um, let's say an l to the e1 isogeny that's what i call phi one here um, and we are able to, um, or basically we can reduce um, the number of anamorphism ring computations by translating um, the already computed anamorphism ring of E1 um, to uh, via this, um, this guest isogeny. And then we basically end up in a situation where we're trying to fix, uh, we're trying to find a fixed degree isogeny uh, like we were earlier, but we have reduced our um, our si parameter size where our um, so isogeny degree. Um, and we can then use uh, one of the um, one of the algorithms, um, so Kornakia or Coppersmith, um, to obtain a solution to this smaller degree isogeny problem. Um, or of course, we have to guess again um, this isogeny here um, in point one um, if we don't find a solution to our smaller um, isogeny problem. And in the end, of course, we can then uh, compose those two isogenies together in order to find a solution to the original problem where we want to find a d isogeny from e1 to e2. And to, in order to um, make sure that um, this, uh, the, the parameters of the kind of um, reduced fixed degree isogeny problem um, are in line with the, uh, the parameters for which um, Coppersmith's trivariate method can solve um, this problem, um, we can, for example, um, reduce or we can look at different types of parameters where um, this l to uh, this l to the e minus e one is not larger than um, p to the zero point six six, and this um, yeah this uh, I guess this uh, brings us to a complexity of O star where we have where we take the maximum of p to one half and p to the epsilon minus one over eight, where the one over eight comes from the or it's the zero point one six where um where it is feasible still to solve the equation efficiently using the Bauer Zhu trivariate method. And in particular we um we obtain um, this kind of um, this kind of overview of which uh, yeah which um, which parameter sets or which costs we have for specific algorithms and and then infer which parameter sets uh, will be easier to solve using our um, our approaches or the state-of-the-art methods where uh, here um, the state-of-the-art is meet in the middle um, for would be for smooth D, um, but for general D, of course, we can only really um, look at exhaustive search. So um, these are all, uh, the cost is all in log P. So um, we can see that um, with Kronaki, actually, we, um, we kind of obtain a, a, a speed up in that case um, if we're looking at epsilon bigger than zero. 
um, and we have no condition on the on the size of um, epsilon or the degree of d. Um, but we, of course, still have to um, remember that there's this slight possibility that um, our heuristics um, or, or that we have made some um, assumptions and we might run into the situation where um, where the algorithm is actually able to solve um, the equation correctly. And um, for Coppersmith, we um, have these two, of course, these two different um, versions. We have the bivariate approach, which is based on um, the Koran, um, the Koran version of Coppersmith, and then the trivariate Bauerju approach. Um, and again, we um, we find that there are um, speed ups in the ranges of where um, where the the epsilon is small enough um, for these two algorithms. And further, we of course can compare with this hybrid approach, um, which is only really possible for smooth D. So this shouldn't really be compared to um, to this state of the art with the general D up here. Um, specifically for classical computations. Um, but we can see that there are some, some possible speedups using this, um, this method, of course. And um, we also um, did some, uh, some experiments um, using mainly the Coppersmith um, myth algorithms and um, were able to um, we're able to um, approach some of the parameters um, that we um, theoretically came up with or theoretically computed, um, but I haven't included the results or our results here. Um, they are in the paper and um, we're also still hoping to improve um, some of the results there. And mainly um, what we, what we um, can say in summary is that um, for smooth degrees, um, we of course compare with meet in the middle algorithms because we have um, the opportunities to um, to compute partial isotonies from both sides, um, and this isn't possible if we have um, prime degrees, for example. Um, so because we always have to compute endomorphism rings, nonetheless, we consider um, epsilons, which are um, larger than a half. So we're looking at um, degrees larger than P. Um, and the hybrid algorithm is the one that works best um, in the ranges from, um, yeah, when we're looking at P to, I think this is actually meant to be P to C. Um, Oh, no, it's not p to the 5 over r. Um, and I guess the the main selling point for our algorithm is that we have very, or we have barely any memory requirements, um, which is, of course, in contrast to um, meet in the middle, which uh, requires quite a large um, amount of storage space. And um, we can also parallelize um, the, the guessing or um, yeah, basically run different guesses in uh, on different machines uh, when we're in the classical setting, of course. And for non-smooth degrees, um, still when we're looking at classical computation, we find that all, um, all, uh, all methods have the same complexity. And, oh, I don't know what's missing there, sorry. Oh, I think I'm missing a slide. Um, well, we can uh, basically use any of the um, any of the methods for um, non-smooth degree, but of course we have the um, we have the the issue with the um, Kornakia um, heuristic that um, yeah we we have to decide whether we want to look at only smaller um, smaller parameters or whether we want to um, 
accept this small failure probability in the Kornakias case. And for when we're looking at quantum um, algorithms, we have no difference between smooth and non-smooth, of course. Um, so we can use Kornakia for um, quite fast and quite large um, degree isogenies um, with a slight uh, heuristic um, issue. And for ranges where we're between um, quite small, I would say still quite small um, isogeny degrees, we can um, use the bivariate Coppersmith um, because of course we have no heuristics there. Uh, yeah. And basically, um, yeah, we looked at different types of algorithms to solve uh, norm equations that arise um, from or that correspond, correspond to uh, isogenies of a fixed degree uh, between super singular elliptic curves. And we um, look at these different types of um, algorithms that we can use for solving Diophantine equations and also utilize more kind of combinations with guessing different parts of the isogeny to improve our uh, performance and yeah, as I've said before, the Kornacki approach does not have any um, size has any size requirements, but has a small heuristic where if one of the um, the variables um, or the, one of the values that we compute um, has too many prime factors, we cannot uh, actually find a solution efficiently. Um, but this, yeah, we hope that this happens in a small number of cases only. Um, and then Coppersmith's approaches, of course, have some conditions on the side of the degree, but we do not have any of the heuristics. Um, and we, in the end, managed to improve um, isogeny finding in the classical or quantum sense um, through quite a large um, set of parameters in the kind of medium size isogeny, I would say. Um, and what we're hoping to still do, or we hope that someone else um, will also be interested in is, um, of course, looking at um, more experiments because, um, yeah, we wanted to um, look at some better, um, yeah, just find a bit more um, experimental support for our, um, for our claims as well. And um, yeah, then of course the question is, can we do anything with these kinds of constructions? Um, is there any way we can um, use this to compute um, during correspondences in a better way or um, make anything interesting with um, these kind of algorithms? And also um, something that we still want to work on is uh, looking at whether Coppersmith's variants um, can also be used for um, for solving the the four variable equations directly, for example, I, I mean, so this would reduce the guessing in um, in general, and then of course we do not have the the Grover speed up when we're looking at um, a quantum version of this um, algorithm, but um, maybe the the four variable version will um, will still allow us to. To compute some isogenies of fixed degree in a yeah in a in a nice way. Um, sorry, I think I've sped through this. Um, so hopefully that means we have some time for questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, and thank you. Uh, let me know if there's any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Yeah. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to. Um, to ask them in the chat or to unmute yourself um, <laughs> to ask a question because that's also fine. Um, Shuttle, for me, your mic had a bit of a, a, a crack at the last slide. I don't know if maybe the, the connection or so got oh. a bit. Yeah. But it's uh, it's not a big big issue to, you could still uh, clearly hear, hear what you were saying. Okay. Um, while people are typing up a question in the chat or unmuting themselves, I had a bit of a question or maybe a, a, a pointer to you. Um, could you could you ex actually explain a bit of this intuition behind Coppersmith's uh, these these Coppersmith's um, 
algorithms and especially where this bound on epsilon comes from because that's this is, seems to be quite important in this algorithm. Um, I think the bound, I'm not the best person to ask about. Um, but I mean, Coppersmith's algorithms in general are kind of, I guess, a way to use lattice reduction um, to generate, or uh, you generate different polynomials and use lattice reduction to um, come to a, a, come to basically a small solution to these equations. Um, and I think the kind of different ways um, you can approach this, uh, this problem is by um, using different types of um, different types of kind of deduced uh, polynomials that you use as um, your, yeah, your um, equations in the in the lattice um, and of course there's some kind of trade-off between using more um, more polynomials and then of course um, the lattice growing or the um, the um, reduction algorithm taking a lot longer um, but yeah I, I can't really say why we have these specific um, these specific uh, bounds on the on when on when this works. Um, I don't know if someone else is here from the group who wants to join in for that question. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we, I mean, we have some, I think, uh, experimental support for the the one eighth um, that we compute. I don't know what's that feature was for you. Um, yeah, maybe I can is interact there? a little bit. Uh... So I mean, some intuition behind Coppersmith is that you have a polynomial with somehow a particularly small solution, and then, I mean, in general, the the original Coppersmith works uh, with modulo solutions. I mean, you could do this here as well. I guess you could do a modulo d solution in, in this setting, for example. And then the idea is that you create a bunch of polynomials, uh, <clears throat> which which should have the same the same solution by by very simple tricks. I mean, you you multiply the polynomial by by a variable, or or you just add. Uh, I mean, if you work modulo d, for example, you just add the multiple of d, and then you create a bunch of polynomials which all have this like very small root, um, and then um, so this creates a lattice of polynomials, and then. Uh, and then you use lattice reduction techniques to to find um, a polynomial with very small coefficients. Um, <clears throat> and then in general, it's somehow, I mean, it, the modulo D version basically turns into like uh, just finding, uh, like factoring a polynomial, for example. So the, the one variable and then modulo D version, for example, is that you, you um, um, you find a particularly short polynomial, meaning that the coefficients are rather small with a small solution, and then you just can re re reduce that to like root finding over over the reals, for example, which is easy. Um, I mean, it gets more and more complicated the more variables you have, and the more and, and less and less precise. The the reason being that. Um, you somehow when you create these new and new polynomials, you it, it's it's harder and harder to ensure uh, algebraic independence of the polynomials. Um, so when 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 you when you have just two variables, um, you, you you can do that. So this is done in the Coron paper, and then the, the the bounds are quite precise, and then things get uh, more and more complicated. So the the Bauer's rule one actually is just an adaptation of Coron, which. Um, which ensures algebraic independence. So yeah, okay, so actually one, one thing I didn't mention is somehow that you using these lattice reduction techniques, eventually you end up with a couple of polynomials that are short, and then you somehow have to compute resultants. And then I guess uh, this is where the algebraic dependency becomes an issue. And the, the bauer rule gives some some rigorous things, uh, some rigor to this, this Corona approaches for, for three variables. Thank you. 
very cool uh, shuttle. Thanks for the talk. Um, actually, I had a question. So, mm -hmm. could you go to the the slide with where all of the complexities were listed, basically? Okay. So, like for the uh, epsilon to be bigger than me. I, I just wondered, like, if you it it would be kind of like interesting because I guess like a lot of these one halves come from computing the endomorphism. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of interesting just like if you assume that you already have the end endomorphism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Complexities course. are then. But I guess I like they're always there's like no values of epsilon where you get something that's uh polynomial time. Like no. Okay, so they're always I mean in the classical case, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just like looked at the last mm -hmm. one, which said epsilon minus one eight, but then I realized epsilon <laughs> had to be bigger than one fourth. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't really. Mm -hmm. No, but it's very cool. Um... I'm also just, um, they're obviously in the Kronakia classical, there should still be a factor for the factoring of this one big N. Yeah, um, yeah. That also needs to be considered um, if we're looking mm. at the classical things. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, for the hybrid approach, so so this this uh, hybrid approach is only combining with copper smith, right? Is it like yeah, this is it, only copper smith. Mm -hmm. Does it not make sense to do like a hybrid approach together with the Cornacia one? Is it just um, always worse? Yeah, because um, I mean, um, as you can see with the with the general Cornacia, I guess, and the copper smith trivariate over, over here. That you always have this two e instead of that mm. uh, two mm. epsilon instead of epsilon, um, and over here, yeah, like okay. the, yeah. the other one as well. Um, of course. So yeah, as, <laughs> as long as you can make sure that the that the parameters that you solve in for which you actually solve this fixed degree problem fall into the range of covariate copper smith, it should always be better. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Okay, well, thanks. If anyone else still has a question, then they should be quick, um, because otherwise I will, uh, I, I, I am going to now thank Charlotte again uh, for the great talk. Yeah, um, thank you, everyone. And with that, also, thank you for wrapping up. Ah, there is actually a small oh. question. Um, so Sina writes, she did not completely understand what step four is needed for. Does KLPT require an element of norm D as input? The ideal, the idea I had of T so far was that it did internally solve norm equations, for example, using Cornacia. So I have the impression that you do that twice, but I probably just don't know it well enough. Ah, um, well, yeah, I think um, we do want to to find a, a specific um where is it a specific um element in the um in the norm uh, in the in the ideal because otherwise um we don't have the correct input in the end um, um because otherwise KLPT I think only works really for um different sorts of parameter sets and doesn't um always provide you with the I mean, I guess KLPT usually provides you with a different degree than what you really need if you just apply it to, um, if you just use it on the ideal in general. But um, so we do make need to make sure at some point somewhere that um, we can find something of the right degree. I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. Um, Does that somehow answer your question? Yeah. Um, is this a commented question as well? Yeah, that's correct. Um, But we do need to compute the um, 
compute this. Um, oh, thank you. Um, that is a, I guess, yeah, we need to find this alpha um, in order to be able to actually compute this J in order to be with this, the correct GUI in the end. Yes. Yeah, I hope that somehow answered the question. Yeah, I I mean we're um yes, we're solving this equation in just a I guess a different way. Um we're looking at we really just looked at this uh, norm equation and thought, how can we do this um specifically in these kind of medium range um medium ranged uh, degrees. So um we didn't really think we could use KLVT for that. Oh, are you more talking about um what how we actually do step five? Um, because then I guess this is just a part of KLPT, um, or it uses some results that are in the KLPT uh, paper. Uh, this. Yeah, so step five, I mean, you can do it in a million ways, I guess. You probably don't quite need KLPT, and you might need KLPT if... Uh, the the isogeny degree was not smooth or or its kernel is uh defined over a large extension <clears throat> but that's more like a standard step that you have once you have a connecting ideal high return it's an isogeny so that that part is klpt but the other parts of the algorithm is is somewhat orthogonal to klpt Okay, I think that solves uh, the question for everyone. Um, if anybody still has another question, then now you actually have to be really fast to type in the, in the chat because now I'm going to uh, wrap up and thank Charlotte again for the great talk. Uh, and I will mention that what well, this was the last talk, so you also wrapped up the season. Um, so this was the last talk of the of 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 the fall semester, and we will continue again in uh, in spring, as you know. And it will probably be February or March. And of course, for next uh, in spring, we also have Eurocrypt, where we have our affiliated event. So we hope to see many of you there. So for now, I will say uh, goodbye to most of you. But if you want to hang out a bit more uh, and chat with us after the session, then feel free to stick around. Yeah, thank you so much, Charlotte. I'll end the recording. <laughs>